That would mean a maximum sentence that goes up to life imprisonment. So the executive order states that language such as from the river to the sea is considered anti-Semitic speech. Um, and so we're asking for folks to refrain from that. The best part of your speech, you said stay in your lane 10 plus times. Bruh, take your own advice. Canada may become a digital dystopia under a new law, an insane censorship scandal at a Texas university, a streamer accidentally proves that he can't read, and TikTok continues to attack Harrison Butker. All that and so much more is coming up on today's episode of Brad vs. Everyone, my daily series where I take on the craziest ideas from across the internet and our politics from a center-right, independent perspective. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and sticking around. And if you're a returning viewer, don't forget to hit that like button and please comment with your thoughts as we go along. I do read the comments and I pick a few to respond to in every episode. Now, before we get into our heavy hitting coverage of all the serious stuff going on in the world, I want to tell you about something kind of lighthearted. Prince William has been named the third sexiest man in the United Kingdom for 2024. And man, things might be rough in the US right now, but at least they're not that bleak. Or did I miss a memo and is sexy one of those words that means something completely different in British English? Because otherwise, no hate to Prince William, but I have questions. Now, we need to talk about Canada, where one of the most disturbing and dystopian pieces of legislation I've frankly ever encountered covering politics is advancing towards becoming law. The Liberal government recently put forward something called the Online Harms Act, legislation which has well-intentioned goals of cracking down on unlawful online behavior and reigning in hate, but would institute a dystopian censorship regime. As the Wall Street Journal reports, the Online Harms Act would introduce not one, but three new bureaucracies, a Digital Safety Commission of Canada to, quote, ensure that operators of social media services are transparent and accountable and contribute to the development of standards with respect to online safety, and a Digital Safety Ombudsperson of Canada to provide support to users and advocate for the public interest in relation to online safety, and a Digital Safety Office of Canada, which would support the commission and the Omsbud person in the fulfillment of their mandate. Now, you might be wondering how these bureaucracies would function, and this is where things get creepy. The legislation would give anyone the ability to file a complaint with the government alleging online hate speech. The commission would have the power to levy fines of up to $20,000 in Canadian, which is around $15,000 U.S., payable to the complainant, not the treasury. So the person making the complaint would get the money. That would open the door to this massive influx of complaints, Michael Geist, a University of Ottawa legal scholar, told Toronto's Globe and Mail. And the standard of proof would be the balance of probabilities, not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So they would only have to be 51% sure that you actually did the thing you're being accused of to hit you with thousands of dollars of fines. That would then go to the person making the complaint. What could possibly go wrong? The bill would subject non-compliant social media companies to draconian fines, up to 6% of global gross revenue. It would establish a new speech crime of advocating genocide, which could lead to life imprisonment. Here's more reporting on that from the CBC. So Rafi, this bill also proposes some criminal code changes. The government wants to increase sentences for online incitement of hatred, specifically for promotion or incitement to genocide. That would mean a maximum sentence that goes up to life imprisonment from the current five years. So this is the most disturbing part of the whole thing for me. You could literally get a life sentence in jail for words that come out of your mouth, but no actual actions. And at first glance, it might sound reasonable, right? Because genocide is obviously evil and advocating for it isn't good, but it's not actually simple to draw a line of what qualifies as advocating for genocide and what doesn't. Look no further than the ongoing Palestine-Israel conflict and the passionate debate about it where both sides think the other is effectively advocating for genocide. The pro-Palestinian people think the Israeli military is conducting a genocide, which the Israeli supporters vehemently disagree with and dispute, and they argue that Hamas, which 
some people support is actually genocidal. And then if you're defending Hamas, you are advocating for genocide. You see how this isn't a clear cut thing? Oh, and what about the people who say that disagreeing with trans activism is advocating for trans genocide? Or what if defending the existence of the United States, despite colonialism, is viewed as defending or advocating for the genocide of native and indigenous people. It's a total Pandora's box that would obviously stifle and chill speech that is perfectly legitimate and well within the bounds of normal everyday political debate. With potential life sentences? Nobody's going to even take any risk of saying anything even possibly close to it. That would chill debate and lead to self-censorship that would undermine the spirit of open conversations that you need in any democracy. Thankfully, the conservatives in Canada are pushing back on this new legislation. With Parliament on a break, Conservative leader Pierre Poilievre was in southern Ontario, where he was asked about legislation expected next week, a government bill, to fight hateful and violent material online. What does Justin Trudeau mean when he says, when he says the word hate speech? He means speech he hates. Poiliev unloaded, calling the Prime Minister woke and authoritarian. I point out the irony that someone who spent the first half of his adult life as a practicing racist, who dressed up in hideous racist costumes so many times, he says he can't remember them all, should then be the arbiter on what constitutes hate. It was one of Poiliev's most pointed digs at Trudeau over revelations that emerged in 2019 that years ago he wore blackface. I should have known better, but I didn't. And I'm really sorry. I do have to agree with this. The irony is not lost on me. That the woke dude pushing this Orwellian new censorship bill did blackface in the past repeatedly. It's almost like he's trying to overcompensate now and show how not racist he is by enacting this dystopian system. But the people of Canada shouldn't stand for it. And more importantly, the people across the rest of the Western world need to look at this and remember why we cannot take our freedom of expression and freedom of speech for granted. It's not just in third world countries where authoritarian censorship regimes can be implemented without stringent legal protections like our First Amendment for even the most vile of speech. Advocating for genocide, for example, in most cases would be clearly protected by the First Amendment. Without those stringent protections for even the most controversial speech, even supposedly free, supposedly advanced Western nations like Canada can descend into woke dystopia. But that's just my take on it. Let me know what y'all think in the comments, especially my viewers in Canada. I really want to hear from you. And now let's head down to Texas, where we've got another example of truly chilling censorship, this time coming under Republicans who are in power. Now you might remember that as we've discussed before, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, who is a Republican, signed an executive order that's been criticized by First Amendment advocates, supposedly cracking down on anti-Semitism. And he said point blank on Twitter that anti-Semitism will not be tolerated in the state of Texas, even though anti-Semitic speech, which people disagree on exactly what counts as that, is still protected by the First Amendment in almost all cases. Well, we're now seeing what this looks like in practice, what Texas's regime looks like in practice, that this Republican governor has implemented infringing on free speech. Because at one public college, the University of Texas at San Antonio, they are literally telling protesters they can't say certain words. Take a look at this video of UT San Antonio administrators speaking to campus protesters there who are part of the anti-Israel uprisings. This will, this will be our official record of recording here. You're welcome to this one. Um, so the executive order states that language such as from the river to the sea is considered anti-Semitic speech. Um, so we're asking for folks to refrain from that because we are required to, uh, uh, to enforce that that is not language that's and enforcement is by means of expulsion. No, okay. I have asked you all not to use that language. Yes. And uh, we ask that you all comply with that. Uh, if you do not, we explain it two more times. And then if you continue to not comply with that, we will refer you over to the law enforcement agencies that are in our area. Okay, thank you. So we would greatly appreciate that you comply. All right, thank you. 
think you have more screens. So Texas Republicans have literally implemented speech police at public college campuses, which are bound by the First Amendment. With free speech warriors like this, who needs woke progressives? Now look, you don't have to like this pro-Palestine, anti-Israel speech, the from the river to the sea, you can find it deeply offensive, all that. But it is unquestionably within the bounds of protected First Amendment speech. It doesn't come anywhere close to meeting the extremely narrow criteria for something to be considered incitement of violence, which would have to lead to imminent lawless action. A chant, even if you one that you think is inherently violent about something happening halfway across the world, is not going to meet that exception. So what you have is the same Republicans like Greg Abbott who say they believe in free speech simultaneously cracking down with the threat of law enforcement at government schools funded by taxpayers on anti-Israel speech. Set aside your views on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Maybe you're the biggest Zionist in the world. If you support free speech, if you support our First Amendment, you cannot support this. Personally, I hope the University of Texas gets its pants sued off for this and that the courts strike down Governor Abbott's executive order for the unlawful act of censorship it is. All right, up next, a little bit of levity, I guess, but it's also deeply depressing. This mega popular streamer just accidentally proved in real time that he literally can't read. The streamer Aiden Ross has millions and millions and millions of followers across Instagram, TikTok, Kick, and other platforms. Young people tune into him in mass numbers, but he is functionally illiterate, as him even attempting to Google a word and read the definition just accidentally revealed to the world. What does a fascist mean? Um, it means you are a far right authorization on you on ultra does it ultra ultra oh my god ultra analyst anal analyst political ideology movement characterized by dictator leadership centralized autocracy militarism for forcible suppression suppression of opposition so i don't know what that means right i swear to god i don't know what the f fascism is i don't know what the f is benito mazuli and giviante Gen Gen genitale and jason stanley like who the f these people bro Never heard of my life. What is an example of a fastest? Yo! All right, bro. See what I'm saying, chat? Like, this is why I don't fuck with y'all, bro. Um, y'all know I'm agnostic, but this stuff, this has me praying. God, we need another flood. Noah's Ark 2.0, baby. We gotta reboot this whole thing and start it from scratch. I mean, I feel bad for this young man. I mean, he literally can't read. And uh, while that's to some degree his fault, I imagine it's also a failing of our public education and school system. But he's, I mean, I, I think there are sixth graders out there who could read that definition and maybe they'd not know one word or two words or mispronounce one word or a name they hadn't heard before. But like the stream of errors is is comical, but then... On the other hand, once you think about it for more than a second and you realize that millions and millions and millions of young people are tuning into this person and getting their information from them, it stops being funny. And it honestly just becomes terrifying. Why does the internet constantly reward with fame the absolute bottom of the barrel? I try really hard not to be a doomer, not to be unduly pessimistic and all of that, but this stuff really saps me of hope. I mean, it's bad enough to not know what fascism is. You really hope that people would have learned that through even just like high school history. But okay, we all Google stuff sometimes that we really should remember or should know. But to not even be able to read a basic definition, I mean, to not know what any of these words are, not have heard of any of these people who are famed historical figures, please let us know. Aiden Ross, what school you went to, what high school, so we can revoke their funding and just delete it and start over. This kind of thing genuinely makes me question humanity, question democracy. This person's vote counts the same as yours or mine. I mean, I guess democracy is right. It's the worst system except for all the other ones, right? But our founding fathers built our system of a republic, a not a full democracy, right? But a democratic republic, they built that on the assumption that we would have an informed and engaged population. 
and I know this is just one streamer, but guys, if you're not looking at the data and you're not looking at the surveys and you're not noticing a broad trend across all the generations, but particularly acute among Gen Z, of civic ignorance, of low literacy, of shocking, shocking levels of reading comprehension, of media literacy, of critical thinking, then you're not paying attention, babe. You're just not. And a system where the people ultimately have the power cannot function, cannot survive in the long run with so, so much widespread ignorance and so, so much widespread delusion and misunderstandings and inability to comprehend basic information. I don't know what the solution is, y'all. I really don't, but something has to change. This cannot continue. And we can't just treat it like a meme because it's hilarious, yes, but it's also serious as a freaking heart attack. Let me know what you think. Are other streamers like this or is it just this one guy? And don't forget to hit that like button. Now up next, it's time for Delulu Epidemic, my segment where I spotlight people who are showing they're stupid. Today, this New York Times reporter and Pulitzer Prize winner doesn't understand basic economics. Nicole Hannah-Jones tweeted, Most wealth is not used to create jobs. Most wealth is stored away and used to create more wealth for the wealthy family. Oh my god, babe. Create wealth how? By investing in successful businesses? Because that would be creating jobs. By putting their wealth in savings accounts? Because that money then gets loaned out by banks. For investments that create jobs, by spending their money on luxury yachts or big houses, because all those things involve tons of jobs in their construction and sale and manufacturing and so much more. The only way the money wouldn't be involved in creating jobs if they, is if they were hoarding it in cash or in liquid form and not, not putting it anywhere. But for billionaires, that's less than 5% of their wealth. That's totally fine if you, as an everyday person, didn't know all of this. That's totally understandable. But when you have political surprise winning reporters at America's most famous newspaper displaying this level of profound and casual ignorance. That's a serious red flag. How can these institutions accurately or fairly or productively cover our economy while their staff simultaneously have no idea how any of it works? Nicole Hannah-Jones, baby girl, your Delulu is showing. Up next, it's time for Brad vs. TikTok, my segment where I react to the craziest ideas going viral on the Clock app. Make sure you're subscribed and don't forget to hit that like button. And now let's look at one mega viral TikTok of a woman attacking NFL kicker Harrison Butker, who just caused quite a stir with a controversial commencement speech he gave that's leading to tons of TikTok backlash like this. Hey, Harrison. You know, we have several things in common. First and foremost, until a few months ago, we were both employed by the Kansas City Chiefs. I cheered you on for six years straight. And with that, I would assume we went to the same PR training. But since all of that obviously left your brain when you went to go give that speech, I thought I'd be a good coworker. Share my notes. Okay, I have to stop here for a second because something about her vibes and her energy in this video is creeping me out. Am, am I the only one? Like, let me know in the comments. Let's get started. These are fucking big. Biggest takeaway? is you now represent a billion dollar organization. You are no longer just Harrison Buckert. You are now Harrison Buckert who plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. And anything you say or do that doesn't align with that brand, scissoring just like the lesbians you hated in that video, oh? will be grounds for termination. Not entirely sure if that last part is gonna apply to you, but I guess we'll Again, she's giving not the best energy to me. And I guess I'll say like yes and no regarding the Kansas City Chiefs. Like in a way you are representing their brand at all times, but also I don't think anybody seriously assumes that every personal opinion expressed in a private capacity by every player of the Chiefs is the official position of the Kansas City Chiefs. Like that's not how anyone reasonable would interpret that. And this lady clearly wants him fired, wants his career turned upside down and fired from his job because he said things she disagrees with and she doesn't like. And I just can't relate to that. Like, I just think that's fundamentally un-American. 
I talked to you guys in a different video about how there were parts of his speech I really don't agree with. But you know what? The same way I want to be able to say my opinion and not have my life canceled or turned upside down, I have to believe that in the same way for him. And I wonder why this woman can't see that. I mean, should she be fired from her job if she posts a TikTok video that a lot of people are upset by? That's not the America that I want to live in. Personally, absolutely not. But those are the rules she's seemingly advocating for here. But they're not only going to go one way, babe. So make sure you really thought this one through because it doesn't seem like you have. Quick minute to dissect some of the language in your speech referring to abortion, IVF, euthanasia, and surrogacy as degenerate culture values. Do you see how that maybe doesn't align with um, the brand? I mean, sure, but it's not like he said, and this is the position of the Kansas City Chiefs, or that he made a statement at a game or wearing a Chiefs jersey. It's like, he said this in his personal capacity, speaking at a private Catholic college. And whether you like it or not, and I certainly don't agree with all of those things being degenerate necessarily, that's a different conversation. That is the Catholic belief. Like, that is the position of the Catholic Church, and he's entitled to his freedom of religion. I understand that people like this might inhabit a bubble where they never encounter those beliefs beliefs, but whether you like it or not, they are somewhat widely held. <laughs> but as you'll see when we continue watching this video, this individual is very out of touch. COVID fiasco. Now, I would assume you know what fiasco means, but just in case you don't, you're referring to the pandemic as a humiliating failure. You know, we had an entire PR training on COVID, bro. We weren't supposed to talk about it. The condescension from her is not cute. Especially because she clearly didn't even understand what he was saying. He didn't call the pandemic a fiasco. He called the way that our leaders responded to it, the decisions they made a fiasco, a disaster, because they absolutely were. This is the least controversial thing of anything that he said. Americans left and right all know that our leaders botched the pandemic. They totally botched it with, with inconsistent messaging, with flip-flopping back and forth on failed policies, with destroying the economy, but not actually really ultimately stopping the pandemic like they said it would. I don't know. Like, if that's not a fiasco, I really don't know what is. So for her to be critiquing that shows that she's not actually offering a criticism from a place of good faith because that was the most obviously true and frankly unobjectionable and least controversial possible part of his speech. But go off, I guess, TikTok girly. You referred to gay people as deadly sinners. The gays love football. We don't want to lose them as an audience, so you might want to reconsider calling them deadly sinners. Are the gays huge football fans? That would be news to me, to be honest. I mean, I'm sure some are, but I don't think the LGBT community is a huge percentage of the NFL's viewership. Now, I do disagree with what he said about the LGBT community, and I do disagree with the notion that being gay is a sin. I talked about that before, but again, like, that, that is the Catholic belief, and he was speaking about religion and faith at a private Catholic college, so it's just not some, like, shocking or totally unheard of position that he dropped there. Although I do concede the point that from a PR perspective, kind of castigating any group of people that ultimately you are, at least in some part, trying to appeal to as an audience is not a good idea. And so while I, I certainly don't want him fired, I definitely, there's, there's a lot I didn't like about that part of the speech, to be sure. Life begins when you become a wife and mother, skip ahead, that leans into her most important title of all, homemaker? You know, we're not going to unpack this from a PR standpoint, but I do want to let you know that the Kansas City Chiefs offer a therapist covered at 100%, both male and female, and I advise that you probably need to unpack that with both professionals. So it is always so ironic to me that the woke people who are like, mental health matters, destigmatize mental health, will then be the first to use going to therapy as an insult or a put down. That hypocrisy aside, she didn't really make any argument, like she didn't actually explain why he's wrong or respond to anything he said. But I totally do see why that portion of his speech rubbed a lot of women the wrong way. I think that being a homemaker, being a stay-at-home mom can be a wonderful thing, is absolutely a legitimate and fulfilling life purpose. 
but it's not necessarily the most important title for every woman in the way that he pretty much implied it should be. Women are all different and they're all individuals. And for some, that's not their ultimate life ambition. That's not what will make them happy. That's not what will fulfill them. And there's lots of other things that could be their most important title. It was also a little tone deaf given the context of speaking at a graduation ceremony where many of these women have just worked for years hard to obtain an advanced degree and now he's telling them that actually the most important thing for them to do is to be working in the home. I can totally see why that rubbed a lot of women the wrong way. I really can. But so let's have that conversation. Let's have that debate. Let's push back on what he said. But don't try to fire him or just obnoxiously insist that he needs therapy. You called the president delusional? You know, I think the organization would let that one go. A lot of Republicans in Chief's kingdom. I mean, yeah, I don't love it when uh, athletes get political, but people like this wouldn't have minded if he was dumping on Trump or insulting Trump. So be consistent, at least. And calling Biden delusional isn't exactly like an outlier take. It's honestly just almost at this point an observable fact. On nine separate occasions since taking office, Biden has in public spoken out to or called for dead or non-existent individuals. If that's not delusional. I'm not really sure what would constitute delusional, babe. Maybe your video? The best part of your speech when you said stay in your lane 10 plus times. Bruh, take your own advice. Kick some balls around. Stay in your lane. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed this informational training. See you later, coworker. I don't know about y'all, but I did not find that particularly informational. That's just me. I will say, I actually think she has a point with that last statement. Harrison Butker did repeatedly say, stay in your lane during his speech. And it is ironic because he was veering into moral, religious, political, and socioeconomic commentary when he's ultimately just an NFL kicker and an athlete. So were he to stay in his lane, he would be talking about football or career or athletics or hard work, but not really straying into this very political territory. I do think it's fair to point out that that's hypocritical, but I'll also say that pretty much everyone is hypocritical on this point. Liberals and progressives like this TikToker are suddenly telling Harrison Booker to shut up and dribble, stay in their lane as an athlete after years and years and years of celebrating the brave and bold celebrities and athletes who've come out with political signals and statements that they agree with. And many conservatives and Republicans are heralding Butker as a hero and an icon, even after many years of them famously telling progressive and woke athletes to shut up and dribble, even in the context of interviews done outside of the sport, not just in-game demonstrations, but like LeBron giving a private interview, saying his political views, they famously told him to shut up and dribble. And it's always unwise to seek political advice from someone who gets paid $100 million a year to bounce a ball. Oh, and LeBron and Kevin, you're great players, but no one voted for you. Millions elected Trump to be their coach. So keep the political commentary to yourself, or as someone once said, shut up and dribble. So hypocrisy on this abounds. Basically, everybody wants athletes to stay in their lane when they say something they don't like and then embraces them when they say something they agree with. I'm sure that somewhere along the line, I've been inconsistent on this. But the way I see it ultimately is that athletes, actors, and other celebrities, they have every right to an opinion just like anyone else. But we really shouldn't take their views on politics or policy or culture any more seriously than we would take some random person off the streets because they're not necessarily any more informed or educated on these matters than your average person. In fact, in many instances, they actually have less education because they dropped out early to focus on sport, which is fine, but then maybe we probably shouldn't look to them for wisdom and insight into profound matters of public policy and governance. All this aside, though, there's just really no reason for the insane, over-the-top level of backlash that Harrison Butker is getting. People are trashing this man to the high heavens on TikTok, and even spreading all sorts of wild conspiracies with no real facts or proof to back them up about him. That's wrong, but so is the hero worship he's receiving in some corners, at least in my view. I really think the whole story should have stopped at athlete gives his opinion. Some people disagree. The end. The push to try to destroy him, get him fired, end his career for speaking his mind is totally wrong and un-American. But he's also not a hero for this, and there's a lot to critique about what he said. At least, that's just my take. Let me know what you think in the comments below. 
And now, I'll read a few of your comments before we wrap up today's show. One person says, It's wild that these same people who are anti-colonization are perfectly comfortable colonizing your home, but she calls it seizing the property. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. These squatters rights people are the first to denounce, you know, settlers in Israel, for example, in the West Bank. And I actually agree with them on that. But isn't that basically what squatters are doing? <laughs> Another person writes, I'm honestly sick and tired of both sides trying to tell women how to live their lives. I hate the fact that the far left makes women who want to live a traditional role feel lesser. And I hate the fact that the far right tries to tell women they can't have a work-life balance and still be a good mom. I hate that both sides are trying to make me feel like crap for wanting balance. Women's liberation was about women being able to choose a life that worked for them. That should be the goal. Why is it that only independent, centrist, moderates get it? I don't know, but that's where I land on all this stuff. Somewhere in the middle. I'd call myself a feminist in that I support equality under the law for men and women, and that I want to treat both sexes fairly, but I don't think men and women are totally the same or that we should discard every tradition and social norm. And I'm not on board with the kind of man-hating genre of feminism, which is unfortunately prominent. But yeah, what this commentator said really does sum it up. Like, just let women choose what kind of life they want. If they want to be a homemaker, a stay-at-home mom, wonderful. I got you. That's great. As long as it's truly a choice and not something being forced on you by a man or by society. And if they want to be the boss babe, if they want to have a career, I hope they give it due consideration and they don't have any regrets. But ultimately, it's their life and nobody knows what's best for them better than they do. Another person writes, I hate when people say, I believe in free speech, but there are consequences. Like, what kind of consequences and from who? Depending on your answer, you do not believe in free speech. My God. Yeah, that's a really good point. Freedom of speech isn't freedom of consequences. Okay, so then putting people in jail for what they say is just consequences. Like, you literally don't believe in free speech. <laughs> Another person said, Brad, your eyebrows are cool. Thank you. I actually used to get made fun of for my eyebrows a lot because they're very thick, but now I do wax them, so... It's not natural. Another person writes, Hey Brad, I was wondering what your views on sensitivity readers are for books slash media. Some say they're good. Others say they're just censorship. Also, what are your views on authors writing outside of their race slash orientation? Like a white person writing a black main character, a straight person writing about a gay main character, etc. I'd be super curious to know. So uh, yeah, I disagree with basically all of that. I can understand the idea of sensitivity readers in theory, but in practice, they just end up censoring authors and blocking people from being able to express interesting or controversial perspectives or experiences or viewpoints. And literature that's just straight ripped down and inoffensive is unlikely to be insightful or that interesting to read. And yeah, when we're talking about fiction, I want people to be able to write about anything. Like, think about it. J.K. Rowling isn't a wizard or a witch either, but she still can write about that. It makes no sense to tell fiction writers that they can only write about their own experience. That would literally delete the concept of fiction. And I don't want to live in a world where what people can talk about or what art they can create is dictated by their immutable characteristics, like the pigment of their skin. And the fact that anyone who's advocating for that thinks that's a open-minded or liberal perspective is genuinely baffling to me. Another person says, Brad, I don't know if I'm correct, but at least seems as though you pre-script your episodes. I'd like to see an episode that is more off the cuff. Well, I don't pre-script them in terms of like writing down words and reading off a teleprompter, but I do outline them and have bullet points and have the sources and things I'm going to talk about in sight ready. And that's probably not going to change because I need to do that in order to ensure I'm only presenting you with factual information, not, you know, misleading stuff I saw on Twitter or stuff from an unreliable source. And because I want to be careful with my words and what I say and not accidentally say something that could be taken out of context or that doesn't really capture my viewpoints. Maybe at some point I'll do some live streams or Q&As or something where you can catch me a little bit more off the cuff. But I, I don't think these I'm ever really going to be doing these episodes totally without a script or an outline. All right, everybody. That's it for today's episode of Brad vs. Everyone, my new daily series taking on the craziest ideas from our politics and from across the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit that like button and please do comment with your thoughts. I do read the comments and pick a few to respond to in every episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and make sure you stick around and we'll talk again tomorrow. Uh, <laughs>